Hello everybody, my name is James and I love cars. Thanks to this wonderful thing called YouTube, I've also had the opportunity to drive a whole lot of them. Everything from Ladas to Lamborghinis. And therefore, I think you would reasonably expect there isn't much out there I find daunting. But my automotive nemesis is actually that most unlikely of things. It's this, a Mark II Ford Focus 1.6 ZTEC, that most humble of automobiles. Why then am I so fearful of it? Well, that is because the last time I drove one of these, it was wearing L-plates. Like an entire generation of Brits, I learned to drive with the AA, and for people of my age, the car of choice for them was the Mark II Focus. My instructor was a lovely chap called Glenn, an ex-REF, take-no-nonsense sort that I got on with really, really well. His car, though, less so, and it's been over a decade and a half since I last experienced a Mark II Focus like this. So then, all these years later, can I finally conquer my fear and get on with what should actually be a pretty good car? Let's find out. <laughs> Today's video gets you all nostalgic for an old Ford Focus. Don't forget, if you're heading towards Auto Trader, to take Car Vertical with you. The super powered super search that cross references a number of databases from around the globe to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase. With everything from accident damage, regardless of whether a car was written off or not, to mileage issues, usage as a taxi, or outstanding finance. It takes just 60 seconds, works on both desktop and mobile with the Car Vertical app, and all you need is either a registration or VIN. For 10% off the service, don't forget to use my discount code, JM. The Mark II Focus was announced in 2004, going into production in 2005, finishing up for most of us in 2010. Though, in certain markets, like China and South America, it actually survived until about 2014. It had a particularly difficult job, this car, because it was following on from the iconic Mark I, a car that really revolutionised the hatchback segment and was a smash hit here in Britain and abroad. To me, the original Focus is not only one of the greatest Fords of all time, but I think actually one of the greatest cars full stop. And I fully believe it deserves in the not-too-distant future to be mentioned in the same sentence as things like the VW Beetle, the Citroen 2CV, though of course nowhere near as long-lived as those cars, nor built in the same numbers, because of when it was introduced that was never ever going to be possible. But still, the Focus did, I think, just as good a job as it was possible of being a nice, decent, ordinary car for the people. It was sized just about right, styled in a very distinctive way, bringing to the public Ford's New Edge design philosophy, and there was enough variety that just about everybody, be they private or company buyer, could find the trim to suit them. Of perhaps greater interest to us petrol heads, the Focus was also a fabulous thing to drive, likely down to the input of one Richard Parry Jones, who had been slowly revolutionising the feel of Fords for some years before. Nice. You, you overtook the car filled with cameras that was doing 30 in a 30. That's a, that's a genius move. On account of how well loved the drive of the Mark I was, Ford opted to retain the basic suspension layout for the Mark II, including their trick control blade rear suspension. The styling evolved and lost a few of the cues that made the Mark I stand out, including the rear windows that stretched all the way to the very back of the car. It also grew considerably by some six inches in length and about five inches in width, with an extra inch of wheelbase and a touch of height too. This means that the Mark II is again a very usefully sized car, Compared with just about anything else on the road today, it's still what you'd consider fairly compact. Yet, there is still plenty of room for four adults, and the boot is of a decent size too. Oh look, Mr Nissan. 
You haven't really got very far, have you? Yet again, Ford made certain to give the car enough variety that there was something for everybody when it came to the Focus. And as a road tester, this makes things rather confusing because there were no fewer than nine different trim levels available here in Britain. You also had a number of different body styles, including hatchback in three and five door guise, estate and saloon. You would be entirely forgiven for thinking that the saloon never made it to Britain, but it did. They are very rare, and I do struggle to think who would actually have wanted to buy one of those and not just the Mondeo of the day, but still, they do exist. Taxi drivers, maybe. That's uh, just about all I've got, honestly. You also had a large variety of engines, including a number of both petrol and diesel options, many of which were carried over or evolved from the outgoing car. What we have here today is the 1.6 litre naturally aspirated four cylinder petrol that makes about 115 horsepower. It was, I think, one of the more popular options and certainly the go to for anybody looking for a nice, normal, sensible, ordinary car. Naturally, this being bereft of forced induction, it's not exactly overflowing with torque, but handily, it is relatively light, about 1,270 kilos. The relative lack of performance is also likely why Ford didn't even see the need to fit disc brakes all round. This has still got drums at the back. You could also get these cars with a number of different gearboxes, including, depending on the model, either a torque converter, four-speed automatic, later the PowerShift branded DCT, and if you take one thing and nothing else from this video, please don't buy an early Ford PowerShift car. They are awful absolutely atrocious. It is a shameful gearbox. Ford, in fact, got involved in legal troubles in many parts of the world because of just how bad it was. They knew it was awful and they sold it to customers anyway. Naughty Ford. There were then a couple of manuals, including both a 5 and a 6 speed. What we have here is the 5, which I think to many is the one they likely remember. And uh, you know what? It's a decent gearbox. Smooth, easy to engage, a shorter throw than you might expect. It's very pleasant as is the rest of the car because, like many other Fords of the era, despite the fact this isn't the fruity one, when you find yourself on a little bit of road like this that you've got all to yourself, it's quite a lot of fun. I haven't put an exhaust camera on today because, uh, well, the exhaust is really, really well hidden. So instead, I'm afraid, you're going to have to listen to me blathering on. Sure, speed isn't exactly the order of the day, but making progress in this car is absolutely delightful. It's also got a really keen turn in, considering, of course, the car is still somewhat basic in terms of its front suspension layout and doesn't have the likes of a limited slip differential, nor honestly does it need it. It's a riot, this thing. Of course, this must all be taken within context. It's no Lotus. And once you have got the car loaded up in a bend, the steering does seem to take on an element of inertia. It doesn't really want to deviate from its course. I do love the fact that because it's a hatchback and has decent ride height, you can just do that sort of stuff. There's no torque steer because there's no torque. Let's just put it through these bends here. And to be honest, the suspension actually works better the harder you go, yes. Farmers have been kind and left lots and lots of detritus on the road. Oh yeah, thank you, farmer. I mean, I'm foot welded here and eventually we will get to the speed limit, but you know, <laughs> I'm enjoying this. I, I really, really am. Visibility is very good. The B pillar hadn't yet crept too far forwards here. And I've got to say this later facelift car, which was introduced in 2008, actually still looks to my eyes semi-modern. You know it's not a new car, it's very, very obvious, mostly because new cars generally are horrendously ugly and massive. But it just does its job really well. It's even good on fuel, and its owner, Shutan, who also brought me the Mark I Focus that I reviewed a couple of years ago, like this A1.6, says that in mixed driving he gets about 450 miles to a tank. If memory serves, that's about 55 litres, which is also in of itself a very good size for a car in this class, meaning that if you do big miles, you're not going to have to stop at the fuel station every single day. 
I like that. I appreciate the small touches, and this car is full of plenty of them. Although, we do have to remind ourselves that this car was built a long time ago now. This being a 2010, I know feels a touch more modern, but let's be honest, as a model, it's a 2005, and so you still have manual windows in the back. We do have electric adjustment for the front windows and mirrors, but uh, no electric adjustment at all for the seats. We do have air conditioning, which is nice, and a quick defrost heated front screen, which was a very typical Ford thing of the era. Beyond that, though, the car isn't exactly overflowing with gimmicks. You could get a few nice things with these, but honestly, by today's standards, uh, we're not talking about anything exciting. Bluetooth was a revelation back in 2010. It does have little clips in the back that you can just uh, put the seat belts into when they're not needed. That's nice. The interior is a noticeable step up over the Mark I, and I know that was deliberate because it was one of the areas that car was criticised. You get in this and it feels like a, you know, normal cheap Ford from a few years ago, but the Mark I just wasn't quite good enough, particularly as the Mark IV Golf arrived around the same time and showed everybody just how nice the interior in an ordinary car could be. This then is a perfectly decent, nice, normal, ordinary car that should do the job for just about everybody. Why then is it that I am so fearful of it? What about the Focus makes me so nervous every time I, I see one? Well, I have been reminded of it today, in fact, to be honest with you, I never, ever forgot it. It is the fact that getting one of these off the line is far, far more tricky than it should be. Even now, with my hundreds of cars and hundreds of thousands of miles and near two decades of experience, I find a Mark II Focus a tricky so-and-so to simply start. And it's ruddy frustrating that. Let me talk you through some of the problems, because there are a number all happening in unison. First off, the biting point of the clutch is really, really high, and you get to the point where you wonder if you've actually got the car in gear or not. Then, because it doesn't have all that much torque, if you are trying to move away on the clutch alone, it's going to be rather difficult, so you do need to apply a little bit of throttle. But as a learner driver, you are, of course, always worried about burning out the clutch or doing something silly, and so you're always going to be a little bit cautious. This is just frustrating. It's a really basic flaw. There are very, very few cars out there I can think of, which in standard guys that are relatively modern, are this difficult to just get off the line. It's... <laughs> ah, oh, oh, I just, ah, you know, you, you know what I mean? But that aside, I really do quite like these. I shouldn't. I just shouldn't, because they did traumatise me. I mean, every single time, in every lesson that you came to a stop, I felt like I was just a useless driver that was never going to make it. And as somebody that was really, really keen on driving cars, driving nice cars, and being a good driver, oh, this made me feel so inadequate. It's even done that again today, but I shall defeat it. The spectre of the Mark II Focus shall be vanquished, I tell ye. And you know what, it, it is a decent car. That aside, and maybe in other models with a little bit more go, it would be a bit more enjoyable. Incidentally, I have driven another Mark II Focus in recent memory. That was a modified ST. And I'm sure for many people watching, it's those that are the ones you think about. Just to jog your memory in case you've somehow forgotten, those were the ones where Ford decided, in a moment I think of genius, to drop in the front the Volvo-derived two and a half litre, five cylinder. That's a magnificent engine. It went in both the ST and the Mighty RS, a car that frustratingly I've never driven. I've done the Mark I and the Mark III. There is no Mark IV, nor will there ever be. I'm just missing the Mark II. So if you happen to have one, preferably a standard or only lightly modified one, and you'd like to see it on the channel, please do get in touch. The brakes work quite well. Very uh, punchy, very nice. Right, let's uh, try to do the full driving school thing. You know, handbrake is on. Let's find the biting point, get the car leaning back. It's still frustrating. I still feel like I'm going to stall it. 
Today, the ST and RS are commanding fairly strong money, but I have to say I was shocked when I hit Auto Trader this morning and went to see exactly how much one of these will cost you. Because it turns out not only are these a fairly decent car all round, they also happen to be just about one of the cheapest out there. I found a whole bunch of examples for or just under a thousand pounds. And this very tidy, exceptionally well cared for example cost Shutan just two and a half grand. He got it to go alongside his Mark 1 and in essence to replace a BMW 4 series, which he said was a perfectly nice, decent car that he just didn't feel anything for. This sits in that nice category where it's still modern enough to be fairly reliable. It's simple enough that there isn't all that much to go wrong and if it does break, just about any decent mechanic should be able to sort it with parts and the like not costing all that much. Availability for those is still fairly good. Though, it is worth pointing out if you are considering buying one of these, I would recommend trying to spend maybe as much as you possibly can. The reason being that the difference between a one and two thousand pound example seems to be huge. When I googled common failure points for Mark II Focus, I was given the automotive equivalent of war and peace. It would appear there is no single part of this car that hasn't broken for somebody. But as it may not shock you to hear, the one big thing that is becoming an issue now is rust. And that is a particular issue because it's that which is going to make a car fail its MOT and it's that which is likely going to take it off the road. Your passenger window no longer deciding it wants to go up or down or your aircon no longer blowing icy cold like this one does is an inconvenience. But your uh, car being Swiss cheese underneath that's a problem. These sadly are still in that category where even if you buy a nice one, if something really big happens, it's going to be economically more sensible to just start again. Just buy another one. And I hate saying that because it means these are the sort of car that are in that sort of awkward position now where nobody's really going to want to save one. But over the next decade, they're going to get rare quickly. I've seen it happen with the likes of the Mark I Focus. One day, they seemed to be everywhere. The next day, they were gone. And those that were left weren't exactly great cars. Because these were aimed at people trying to buy something a little more reasonably priced, or at fleet buyers, they didn't tend to get that well cared for in the first place. This really is a fantastic example. I'm honestly shocked at just how good it is. You can tell that whoever had it has just looked after it. Even the engine bay, I'm told, wasn't cleaned by the dealership, nor has it been cleaned by Shutan. And it's superb. Full of plastic, mind. Typical Ford, but, uh, you know, looks good. Well, tidy. You know what I mean. In any case, if you are at that point in time where you're looking for either a first or perhaps even second car, and it needs to be a bit of an all-rounder, and you don't want to spend all that much money, the Mark II Ford Focus is an annoyingly good shout. So, that was a little trip down memory lane for me in a car that actually I'm glad I've had the chance to revisit. I want to say a big thank you to Shutan for bringing it out and invite all of you to hop into the comment section and share your stories of whatever it was that you learned to drive in, be it a Mark II Focus or maybe a Mark II Escort or something else entirely. Anyway, thanks as ever for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.